Welcome to Markets Now. I'm Michelle Brock along with Randy Martinson with Martinson Ag. Well, we saw higher openings and all, but the wheat market this morning as we speak, we're still mostly higher except for uh, wheat and a few of these cattle contracts. And Randy, let's talk about uh, corn and soybeans because, you know, basically we're higher, but most of this is kind of squaring up here ahead of the WASDE report. That's the big market mover tomorrow, isn't it? It is. You know, and last week, I mean, we were pretty quiet. I mean, the markets didn't really do a lot. It seems like we've just been marking time waiting for these numbers to come out. And of course, everybody's expecting that we are going to see lower yields come into this report uh, just because of the hot, dry conditions that we've put, uh, seen, especially as of late. But they're also worried about what's going to happen on the acre side. And then also there could be some concerns about demand, especially on the export side. So let's break this down a little bit. First of all, um, as far as yield cuts, talk about what we might be looking at and if USDA will be very aggressive in your mind in this report. You know, this is the first infield surveys from USDA, so it'll be their first boots on the ground. And, you know, it happened at the time when that last heat wave was coming through. I think we will see a little bit of a decrease as far as uh, the corn yields are concerned. A lot thinking that we could drop below 170. I don't know if USDA will make that big of a cut, but I do think that we could see a drop of about, you know, two bushels, maybe three as far as corn is concerned. Soybeans, I think they'll be a little more conservative. Uh, I'm looking for a, probably a one, maybe one and a half, well, a one bushel cut, I think, as far as soybeans are concerned. But that's going to make stocks very, very tight for soybeans unless they make some adjustments to the demand side. And Randy, there's some private estimates under 50 bushels per acre on soybeans. If we got a number below that, that would really get the market going, don't you think? It would. You know, you look at taking two bushels off the uh, production, you're taking 160 million bushels out of production. You're putting stocks down below 100 million then with no change to the demand side. And that certainly would be bullish as far as the soybeans are concerned. It just shows just how tight the supplies are going to get to be. And we've had really good demand. I mean, you look at the last 11 or eight out of the last 10 days, we've had an export sale of soybeans. Absolutely. What about the acreage number? FSA came out with acreage uh, the same time as the August report last month. And so what is the expected adjustment that we're going to see in this report as a result? You know, the talk has been that we could see a million more acres of corn, uh, 200,000 more acres of soybeans. You know, I could believe the soybean number just because of how late the planting was up in the northern regions. It's tough for me to take the the million more in, in corn. I, I think that might be a little bit of a stretch uh, to think that we could see that many more corn acres. And as you mentioned, demand is the other factor. And certainly there's some thought that even if we see yield cuts, that USDA will also lower demand at the same time, right? Right. I mean, we wrapped up the marketing year for you know, the 2022 export marketing year for corn and soybeans last week, and we fell short when you look at the raw numbers for exports. Now, of course, there's always some giveaways and some other things that they come in and adjust that number going forward. But it we did fall short, and I wouldn't be surprised to see exports drop a little bit for both corn and soybeans. Now, we saw Soybeans, let's go back. Uh, we saw soybeans drop last week, despite the fact that we had continued hot, dry weather and a big drop in crop ratings. And so weather is kind of starting to take a back seat here, isn't it? It is. I mean, you get to this time frame, you get to September and you start hearing warm, dry conditions. That's actually a little negative because that means harvest will be able to get rolling and with very little interruptions. Now, we are hearing some rains in the forecast right now for the Southern Plains. That's going to you know, slow down some... Um, field activity, but it is bearish for the wheat because it's bringing much needed moisture for the newly planted or what's going to be planted for the winter wheat crop. Uh, it is a little bit supportive for corn and beans as harvest is trying to get rolling. Yeah. And really weather, like we said, starting to move to the backseat. So as soon as we get done with the WASDE, then we're going to start looking at what yield and combine reports. Yield, combine reports, and South America weather will start to take uh, precedence because now they're starting to get their crop planted. You know, Brazil is now allowing producers to plant before the September 15th time frame. So we'll start to hear some uh, soybean planting uh, results coming out of that country. Yeah, you mentioned uh, Southern Plains rains. Obviously, the wheat market hitting more contract lows here this morning, I think, in all of the exchanges. And so, you know, how much of a race to a bottom to the bottom is there? I mean, do you see a lot more downside risk to this market? Where do we find support? 
You know, I don't see a lot more downside risk to, to wheat. What's been surprising is that, you know, once we got the, that halfway through the winter wheat, we didn't see any post-harvest rally. We just continue to see the market drift a little bit. Now the stronger dollar has put a little bit of pressure on. We were the cheapest wheat in the world until our dollar started to creep up. And that kind of started pricing us out of the market again. I do think that if uh, Russia could start coming in with a little bit of production problems or some logistics issue on shipments, that certainly would help. But U.S. just has no demand, and that's really kind of what's been holding this market down. And I want to pick up what, on what you said about the dollar because we hit six-month highs last week. And do you continue to see that market inching up here, that dollar index? You know, that right now, I mean, they keep talking about the trouble that China's having with their economy and what their, the central bank is doing there. As long as that continues to have some issues, I think our dollar's got some strength on it, in it. But I would think that it's probably run close to its course and we should start to see a little bit of pressure. It is seeing some downward movement here on Monday. We'll see if that follows through. Yeah. Cattle market. Uh, we had a great week last week. We scored some all-time highs in the feeder market, and I think we actually topped some of those highs here this morning in the feeders. Live cattle, we haven't taken out the contract highs. Do you think we will? I think we will in the live cattle. I think the cattle market's got some room to move. I'm actually looking for strength to continue until we start to see supplies start to hit the market. And I, I do think the cow-calf guy will start dumping their calves a little sooner. Even though they've got the feed to, to uh, take these in the background of the cattle, I think the prices and the, what can be returned right now, I think a lot will sell this, uh, this year's calves or this spring's calves. So I think once that starts to happen, we'll see a little bit of a downturn. But I think live cattle will be able to hold on we have been seeing a little bit of movement in the boxes that are a little lower prices and demand has slowed down a little bit, but I think that'll start to change once we get a little deeper in the fall. Okay. But Randy, we had better cash trade last week in the South by one to $2. And I don't know what the weighted average is going to come out like, but doesn't that turn this trend here on cash, which may to your point, hold up these futures for a little while or not? We hope so. I mean, you know, we had some slow movement because of the, you know, the weather slowing down movement, the heat. Now we're starting to see a little cooler. I think we're starting to see the cattle perform a little bit better in the feedlots. So we're starting to see a little more movement. Packers are a little bit more willing to buy. And I think they're short bought. I think they need to get some product brought in. So hopefully that'll help push the, the live cattle market so that it's back to contract highs. And let's end with the hogs. Um, we've been chopping around basically um, pretty volatilely in a sideways pattern. Where do you see us breaking out? You know, I think this market is going to continue to see some strength. I mean, we're continuing to see tight supplies. We'll see that probably confirmed in the quarterly hogs and pigs report at the end of the month. But if cattle can stay strong, I think that's going to slowly pull the hogs with it. Do you think we're also going to maybe start pricing in some speculation of maybe lower numbers as we go into the hogs and pigs report at the end of this month or not? I think we will. And then you're hearing some conflicting stories, you know, what's going on with China. Their demand has been good on soybeans. I think they could start looking at, as we get in the fall, looking at replenishing some stocks and looking at importing some hog, you know, some pork again. So I do look for the, the hog market to be able to continue to stay strong. Yeah. Uh, China demand and sow liquidation seem to be kind of the main features here lately. All right. Thanks so much for joining us. Randy Martinson with Martinson Ag. That is Markets Now.